Okay, so let's start with what is formative and what is summative assessments. So in the schooling environment, we get two types of assessments. Formative assessments is basically what we do in the classroom, such as class tests, um, quick um, pop quizzes, just to see if the learners understand the work that we are doing, and then finding out what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, and which um, topics do they understand or which ones they do not understand. But that's what we as educators um, use to gauge how we should teach a topic or how should we teach a topic, right? Or which topic we have to stop at, or which topic we actually have to delve in deeper. Summative assessments, on the other hand, is what every learner dreads. Even as an adult or as an educator, we dread this as well when we were studying. It's the exams and the formal assessments, the ones that you are getting critiqued on, the ones you get getting marks on. Actually, the one that's there to say if you're passing or if you're failing the grade or the subject or the module. Right. So with quizzes or any other uh, tool that can help with assessments, it usually falls under the formative assessment because it's a more informal, it's more of a way for you to get feedback from the learners in a quick way and to see where their weaknesses are and where their strengths are. Right? It doesn't really fall under the summative assessment yet because of the CAPS curriculum and the type of assessments that's already laid out. But hopefully later on in maybe two, three, four years time, digital assessments can be something that can be used in schools. But now it's not. But for now, you can use it as something that you can do in the classroom, right? As a quick activity or even assign as homework, as you'll see later on. Right. So I'm a self proclaimed foodie. I love food, right? So in my everyday life, I always use food analogies. Okay. So this is no different. I like using super analogy because we had a storm a few days ago, a few weeks, it feels like a few weeks, but it was just a few days ago. And that's why I decided the super analogy is going to be the best to explain formative and summative assessment in a more simpler way. So formative assessment is when the chef tastes the soup and makes adjustments. So when you're making a meal and you want to perfect the recipe, you will first taste, you will throw in different ingredients, you will try to see which one is the best, and then you will basically trial and error, right? So the same as in the classroom. You will give them a pop quiz or you'll give them a quick spelling test just to check if they gauge what you have taught them and if there is um, a lack of understanding or a breach that cannot be crossed you will basically go back and try to fix it and then test them again and see if it worked or if it didn't work that's ultimately what formative assessment is summative assessment on the other hand is when the diner tastes the soup so when you're making soup for your family your family tastes the soup and see if your hours and hours of hard work actually paid off. Most of the time, they're not very appreciative and they're like, oh, I don't eat soup or that's not tasting good. But most of the time, it may be tasting good if you have perfected the recipe. And that's ultimately what summative assessment is. It's like an exam. So everything you've taught them in the classroom, they will go sit down and they will basically answer the questions and you as dino will taste what they are writing. Most of the time you are tasting because they write a whole lot of nonsense, unfortunately, but most of the time the soup does taste good, metaphorically speaking. Right, so any questions yet before I continue? If there is, then you can just unmute your mic or put your hand up and then I'll gladly take any of your questions. Please feel free. Right. What we have now in the classroom, or with most classrooms on high school and primary school, is what we like to call it the broken feedback loop, right? I'm not saying that this happens in every classroom, but most classrooms, because of the time constraints and because of the amount of admin and the workload that we have, it's not very um, sustainable to actually have a full loop. So what we do as educators and not educators, we build content and knowledge, so we teach them. Then we assess that knowledge and then we get feedback on that knowledge, right? But it's called the broken loop because it just goes one way. There is no holistic circle, right? Where the feedback goes back to the educator and then they adjust what they are teaching because of the pace that we are going at. And that's what we are trying to change by using digital tools, right? So it can be a way of gathering instant feedback so that you as an educator can also have access to the different statistics and the different analytics so that you can change the way that you maybe teach a topic or gauge which is the topics that your learners might not understand or 
do understand better right so ultimately we want to have a chef's feedback loop as i said i love food so it will always be something that has to do with food so with the chef you will always add ingredients taste ingredients and then determine what's missing maybe a little salt maybe a little pepper maybe a little this a little that and then it will be a full circle where you actually go and basically follow the same procedure until you get that final product right so the feedback that we actually want is the circle one where we build the knowledge we assess the content knowledge we have feedback in the form of maybe their marks or maybe comments and then we using that feedback we identify the missing knowledge right and then we build upon that we try to see what went right what went wrong what didn't actually work right and then at the end of the day we basically have this whole circle where we become better educators but we also help our learners to actually gauge where they are not understanding work or where they are understanding work Right, everyone still works with me. Yeah, I guess so, because there's no questions yet. All right, so now that we've understand what's a formative assessment, what is a summative assessment, and the feedback loop that we want to create, that's where we're going to get to what we're actually here for, the quizzes site. So ultimately, what is quizzes? So, quizzes is an online quizzing tool designed to test a learner's content knowledge. Right, it allows learners to test their knowledge of the content using gamification tools. So using games and different things, because we are in the age where kids are heavy gamers and e-gaming is big right now. A lot of people are actually um, considering e-gaming as a sport, right? And learners tend to actually understand better when they are playing games. Right, for example, in primary school, a lot of the learning takes place while they are playing games. High school, not so much. But that's why with the quizzes tool, we can bring back that um, playful element back into the classroom to help aid teaching. Because I'm an educator from Para High School, a high school educator, and I teach English. And most of the time, English is not seen as a subject that's very exciting. A lot of times, kids just come there and see it as a sleeping period, right? Because there's a lot of readings, a lot of content. And that's why I try to actually add games in the classroom, try to use technology in the classroom to make it a bit more exciting. And as you'll see with the quizzes tool, it's a type of way to actually keep them engaged in the content, but also to provide a different way of trying to see what they know and what they do not know. Because most of the time when you're teaching a Romeo and Juliet or Macbeth and you ask, do you understand? They're all like, yes, sir. But when it comes in exams, it's like, uh, uh no, sir, I knew nothing actually. Okay, and then for the learner, you can assign homework for the learner, they can practice the different quizzes and they can basically engage with the content in their type of way, with the way that Gen Z or whatever gen they are called right now, right? So it's for them to also find the common ground. So you as the educators find a common ground with the learner. So it's not just heavy content pages and work is also a way of having fun. It's a way of engaging and enjoying what you are learning. Okay, so if everyone is still ready and still with me, we'll actually go into what is quizzes and I'll show you the site. Is everyone still with me, Melissa? Hey, it's Jason. They are, they are, looks like they are super excited. Okay, great. So, let's delve into the quizzes site itself so so once you open up your browser we all know open up a browser you will type in quizzes so it's not the normal spelling of quizzes uh, there's a lot of z's at the end i was logged in a few times but i'll go the normal way so everyone can see how it looks so you will first search quizzes you can either search quizzes.com or just the word quizzes uh, just give me a second. Wi-Fi has been ooh, so wonky these past few days. Right? And then you'll pop up onto this page right here. Quizzes will always have the icon with the Q in a purple square. And then we'll just go click onto it. But it looks like you are able to create your own quizzes. You can have a library of all the quizzes that you've already completed. If you are linked to an LMS or um, a learning management system where you are tracking your learners. You can also assign classes. 
and then you've got more and more settings over there. If you scroll down, you can see there are different subjects. Now, one thing that we do have to bear in mind is that this is an um, international site. So that means that there are things from all over the world. It's very American. So you need to go and choose something that aligns to your topic, for example. So you can go and have a look at the languages. If you're teaching English, you can have a look at social studies. Everything is there. So there, if you are going to create some, there's some templates that you can use. There's ready-made quizzes for you. Yeah, you can see one. It's about shapes. So your learners can then play this game in the classroom. Yes, English language arts. There's a lot. There's so many. <laughs> so this is my library. I've got a few things over here. These are quizzes that I've already played. So things that I've, I've with my class, we played a quiz on Matilda because we were reading Matilda at the time. And it's it's already there. <laughs> These things exist. I didn't need to go and recreate everything. It's already there. So let's click on one of them. Let's click on the Matilda one. It's been a while. So I have the option to download it as a worksheet. I can also save it. Um, I can also share it. I can, I can make a copy of it. And I can add my own questions into it as well. And there we have something you can start a live quiz. So when you start the live quiz, this is where you and your learners can work in the class together as they are uh, reading through the book or trying to understand the concept. I was at a primary school last term where every teacher that I spoke to spoke about quizzes. <laughs> it was so much fun because they are the proof that um, that it's working, that it, it increases engagement, that it makes the lesson come alive, that the learners don't mind playing the games over and over again. Learners do want to play it, increases engagement, and it's fun for you as well, teachers. It's not just um, doing a rote test over and over and over. It actually shows you how the learners are improving if you track the, the um, performance over time. So yeah, I can look at the questions. I can change the questions if I want to. I can edit the questions if I want to edit the question. And I can then change it over here. Um, obviously, where you see the lightning bolt, that means that that's a paid for part of it. Uh, but this is just a lot of fun already for the learners just to go through this process. At least it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, you can start the game. And I know my colleague, I don't know, I can't see if he's still in here, Jaku, um, has experimented and worked with the paper mode of quizzes. So the online version is where the learners can, where the learners can play with you. And then the paper mode is where uh, the learners are given a sheet of paper that has a QR code on it and the teacher then while the learners are answering the questions the teacher can then scan around the room with the QR with the device to then pick up the, the learner responses so even if you have limited devices limited resources there is a way around it just with regards to the the, the paper mode um it's a, it really is a wonderful option if you are in a position where you do not have learner devices. A lot of these things require learner devices, but without the learner device in the paper mode, um, you you literally print out, um, you can print up to 60, um, 
60 different codes for the learners that they can use and then you can do there melissa showing on screen you as a teacher use your cell phone and you scan those papers that the that the learners are holding up and what's 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 great about it it's a two-way street because the learners immediately know whether or not they got the answer right because they can see on the board they'll know when when they'll play a one when they'll play a two when they'll play a three so they'll see did i get this right or did i get this wrong and as a teacher you immediately get that that sense of are they getting it right are they getting it wrong yes it is the same very much the same as plickers um as uh, that rob pointed out the the one thing that i really like about quizzes however um over the plickers option is first you can go up to 60 which is useful because we sometimes do have very big classes and secondly quizzes comes with an enormous bank of questions that you can teleport into your your um your quiz so it's so quick to set up a quiz using this really is a very, very cool system. So talking about earlier, um, you can print your cards and then your learners will be able to then uh, play as well. So let's just look at how we can create a quiz. So like I said earlier, you can just get a ready made one because it does exist already. Alternatively, you can make your own one. So you can make a quiz. You can import some of your content from Google Slides or Google Forms. Let's go and make a quiz. Very simple. So we are going to be using our multiple choice and fill in the blank. <clears throat> okay. We're not going to import anything. We are going to make a multiple choice question. So as you can see, you can add a timer to it. You can make it bold. You can underline italics, all the different scripts that you can use. Like we were talking about earlier, you can add audio, but this looks like a, a paid for uh, service up to three minutes. So uh, the teacher will ask previously about your learners who can't read or not can't read, who struggle to read. Yeah, you can put in an audio clip while they are working through everything. Bear with me, I always use examples from English. Um, so I'm going to say, yeah, uh, who wrote Romeo and Juliet? That's my question. So I'm going to give them a couple of a couple of uh, uh, um, answers. Let's try this auto generate all options. I haven't really tried this before, so let's see what happens. It's generating options for me. How cool is that? I don't even need to think about potential multiple choice things. William Shakespeare. Oh, there we go. So right, we're done. We're happy with that. So now our question is sorted. We click on save question. Just so you can, of course, if you wanted to, you'll see at the top these other options included. So if I wanted to award more points for this, if I wanted to give them longer time, if it's a longer question, for example, you might want to be able to do that. Um, I'm just going to say I like that. Save question. Let's go on to the next question, right? So now we're going to say create a new question. We're going to go to multiple choice again. And yeah, just to show you, if you're a maths teacher, you can add really complicated maths questions in here as well. Um, if you wanted to do this multiple choice question, let's, um, I don't, I, as I said, I'm not a maths teacher, so um, we can just say X plus Y, or let's say two X minus five equals X, right? So we're going to say insert. Let's see, let's test our, our, our auto generate options again. See how that goes. And it has given me a whole number of options. It's even solved my equation for me. Um, doesn't look correct, but let's go with that. Right, so, so you'll see here, if I look at that, um, I don't know if there are any math teachers in, in here that can help me out with that, but my uh, limited remembrance of math tells me that 2x minus 5 equals x. Fans, fantastic, it is correct. My brain isn't working all that well today. Um, oh, of course, now I see what I need to do. I need to move the 5 and I need to move the x and then I'll get my x equals 5. How cool is that? 
So again, I think that's a pretty nifty option that you have that auto, that 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 auto answer option that you have immediately. I am able to generate questions. So save question, and the cool thing is you just come up with a question. Quizzes will handle heavy lifting of giving you multiple choice options. From personal experience, having set up many of these quizzes before, it's always easy coming up with the right answer. But coming up with alternative answers that kind of could be confusing, maybe not, that's sometimes the tricky part. And if you look at this, the questions that it's answers that it's generated, I think it's really cool. Who wrote Romeo and Juliet? And it's given me four names of four well-known authors in the in English language. Then this question, 2x minus 5 equals x, what it's done is it's given me four options that kind of, you know, could could seem correct for a person, well, especially for myself, who's not doing maths at a regular rate. I wasn't sure when I saw those answers. But now I want to show you some of the really cool things you can do as well when you're setting up your quiz, which I think is this option of tele things. So let's go back to this idea of I want to add um, questions on Romeo and Juliet. So I'm going to say Romeo and Juliet. I'm going to search. And what it'll do is there's a whole bunch of different questions or, or quizzes that it's finding for me. And I can filter these out by saying I'm only looking for 10th grade questions on Romeo and Juliet. Um, and well, I think the rest of it's pretty straightforward. So now this is the part that's really cool. So now I just click on one of these quizzes. So here I've got my long list of options that I can scroll through. I just click on any one of them. And now I just click on add question. So there I've added a question that was incredibly quick and easy. I've added that question. Let's say, for example, I find a quiz here, 15 questions. I really like these. I'm just going to click add all questions and there we go easy as that i have now created a quiz with 19 questions already in absolutely no time so there i've got that thing set up and good to go i'm going to say add i um, need to publish this thing so let's give it a name um, we're going to call this example quiz Let's give it a subject. I'm going to give it English. Let's give it a grade. Make it 10th grade English. And here I think is one of the most important things we need to keep in mind. This public visible to everyone option, right? So when you're going to create a quiz on you, you don't have the option of selecting a private unless you use the paid for version. What that means, what's so cool about that, I feel, is every single time you're creating a quiz, you are actually contributing to this search bar and this import option. And the reason why that is so important for us to keep in mind is in the South African context, one thing we know is there's a lot of stuff out there, but there's not always a lot of stuff for us out there. I mean, maths is generally kind of uh, useful to, to import stuff. And I think a lot of things regarding um, languages is not that difficult because it is quite universal. But suppose you're looking for Afrikaans things. So let's publish this one and say we're done with this now. And let's say we wanted to go and search in the quizzes library for Afrikaans. Well, let's say we're going to search for Vietnamskap. Five. Just as an example. So there we go. Wetenschap class. Grad 7 geschiedenis. Grad 5 werkwoorden. Schoolvakke in Afrikaans. Beroepe. Grad 6. So you'll see there is stuff on here in Afrikaans. It's not as, 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 as many as we would like. Obviously it says 1 million results. Um, but it's not quite. Now we're just going to filter out Afrikaans things. So there we have 903 results for Afrikaans Wetenskap Grad 5. So there's a lot of on here. But the nice thing is the more we start adding, the more we start contributing to this, to what is out there, what can be imported. And that becomes so powerful the more people use it. So they, there's a very much a sense of community that's built in the background of quizzes that I think is a really, really cool thing for us to to. Um, or very cool thing to be able to use. Right, so um, 
Let's we'll go back to our home screen. So now that we have, um, we, now that we've, we've actually set up our, our quiz, the different quizzes that we have, let's, before we do that, let's first have a look at the sharing option. Because remember, I just spoke about the community sense that we can get through quizzes. So let's go to the share option and see how we can actually share these things. So if I share these things, what I can do is if there are other people that are um, that are, are also on quizzes, that means that you can act that you can take you can share these things with them so that they can make their copies of that. So within a school context, other teachers can just make a copy of the quiz that you're using and they will be able to then run it in their class so that you've got separate reports because the reports are the really powerful part of it. If I copy the link, um, I just want to quickly show you how this works. So, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. Just give me a second. So if I copy that link that I just showed you and I share it over here, it gets shared to you do not need to be logged in. Mine is logged in, but they go straight to this point. Anyone that you share that link with comes here, whether they have a quizzes account or not. So um, I, I, I can't show you that now because I opened it in the guest window, but the guest window, I promise you now, looks exactly the same. So there's no logging in. There's none of that that I've done, um, but it has already been logged in. Right, so here you go. If you want to click on that link, there it is in the chat box for you to click on. Good suggestion. Okay, so um, from that point, if you open it up on your side, you'll see that you have the option to copy and edit it. So you can't just edit my original one, but, but you can edit it when you make a copy. And then you start working on your own one. You can create a worksheet or the worksheet option is, of course, one of those things that you do need to be logged in. Um, but just to show you the worksheet, if you want to have a, a, a one of these kind of printed options, you'll see that it what it does is it takes that quiz and it gives you a, a printed version of that as well, which you can then hand out to your class if you wanted to. But if you want to do the offline thing, as I mentioned, there is that that paperless mode that you can do, which is very cool. I need to go and create all of these quizzes. So if we found this this one, general knowledge questions for kids. So it's a, it should be reasonably straightforward. It looks like a super easy one. We're going to do it anyway. Um, now I can just say play. I'm going to say start a live quiz. I don't need to go and copy this thing necessarily. Um, so I click on start a live quiz. And the way that you're going to do it is the same for your classroom um, or for, for your own quiz, the way that I'm showing you, you now. You pick the option. Now you can go to, this diff, to the different modes that you can play. So there's the T mode, Mastery, Peak and Classic. Um, there's the test mode as well, which does require is a little bit more tricky because now people need to log in, etc., etc. What's nice about the test mode, one of the things that I saw about the test mode that, that is actually quite cool is Quizzes adds a huge gamified element to it. You're going to see now when we play. But I feel sometimes that the the test mode does take, strip away the gamification elements of it, which does make it a bit more serious, which is I uh, sometimes a pretty cool option to have. Right, I'll be honest, I haven't done Mastery Peak yet. I think this is a new way um, of, of going about it, that you're welcome, and I really encourage you to explore it. On that note, what I can say with any tool that you're using, it's so important to constantly check back, are there updates, are there new things, and then play around with what these new elements are. But this mastery peak, um, I, I'm pretty sure will be will mean that you can redo a quiz multiple times until you are able to do well enough in that quiz. But let's just go to the classic mode. Let's not make it complicated. We'll do the classic mode. Um, I've done my quiz, we've got uh, we're not going to set a starting time for the activity. We're going to say you only have, no wait, we're going to say unlimited and we are going to say, let's go 
and let's play the quizzes game, right? Okay, so here is the, I'm going to copy the link to it. I'm going to paste it in the chat. So there's different ways of joining it by the, of, of sharing your quiz. You'll see there's lots of options here. All of these things tend to have that kind of code way that they work about, work about it. Um, and then there's the join my quiz. The, you can take them to that link and give them that code. Right, so let's say we're going to start it now. Right, congratulations, Ami. You won. We're very proud of you. Right, so we'll go on. Um, and here, I think, is where the real power lies of this whole thing. I can see how everyone did with my questions. Now, these are just multiple. Well, these were just, you know, random questions, um, general knowledge questions. But over here, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to see a breakdown of all these things. So I can get a breakdown. Um, if I click on questions, I get a breakdown of how it went. So first question, 18 correct, zero incorrect. Um, over here, it gives me a, a clear overview of the whole of everything that happened. Um, and here I get to review questions. All of this is happening on the screen. So we can discuss this with the learners. I can hide the answers. So now we're talking about what did, who answered what, what were they doing, etc. The ones that went very well. And now we can have a look at each question one by one um, in terms of, of kind of establishing the, reviewing the understanding of these learners. So you'll see it changes the whole dynamic of testing whether or not they know what's going on. There's a fun game that's involved that everyone plays, that everyone gets engrossed in, etc. But there's that feedback side. And there are two sides to feedback that I think are really important to understand always. Um, and that is the ability to have to have um, feedback from for the learners. Someone mentioned that now in the chat. I, as a learner, answer a question, immediately I know whether or not I have it right or wrong. But as a teacher, I get access to this. And just to show you, if you don't want to do this live in front of the learners, let's say you want to have a look at all of that at a later stage, you've got this option over here called reports, right? So there you'll see the reports. So now on reports, I can click on this report and I can see here's the general knowledge one that I played. I can click on that. And it gives me the same kind of breakdown. I prefer this report, to be completely honest, because it feels like it's a less less of a gamified version of a report. So there, the participants, I can see where they went wrong. So I can click, literally click on the participant. I've clicked on Ami the Bray now, and I can go and see what did she actually get wrong. So she got all of this right, all of this right, all of this right. The only one that she got wrong was the festival known as the Festival of Flowers. We'll forgive you for that one, Ami. It is one that I don't think many of us necessarily knew um, but i can also see how quickly she answered these questions if that's an important thing sometimes these things are important to note right so um, you can print it out should you want it 
I don't really know why you would print out individual ones. But the critical thing is if I scroll down to the bottom, here I can start having a look at the learners that are struggling a little bit more, that didn't do so well um, in, in, in the quiz that they answered by checking all of these things here at the bottom, right? So that allows me a lot more insight into a, a something that struggles or learners that struggle. Yeah, I can go per question, individual questions. I can see which questions went well, which questions didn't go well. And then, of course, there's an overview that'll be generated of, of the whole thing. It kind of just gives us these these things. And the critical thing is some someone asked me the other day um, regarding evidence. All of this can be downloaded, of course, downloaded and printed, etc. Um, but then something else that I think is also quite nice to check here is this assign homework option so you can run a quiz with them but then once you run this quiz you can also assign homework um for these and this is again changes the whole dynamic of what you can do so on the one hand what we looked at now was the exciting in-class activity where we are checking what's going on but now we can also have and extended beyond the classroom activity by assigning homework to them. And you can assign homework before they do the quiz as well, of course. Um, not a problem at all. And I know someone mentioned this in the chat. This is the way that I used quizzes a lot when I was still a teacher. Um, just, just to give you a sense of what I prefer to, to do with this. Um, was this participant attempts mode. So here you can allow them to do this quiz multiple times. So you can say, look, you can't do it an unlimited number of times. I'm going to give you um, four or five times that you are allowed to do it. That does mean that they will have to have a quizzes account. So they can't just go in um, without without having an account. But I'm going get, to get to that in a second. We can say that this activity is going to be set for Monday it's going to start at um it's going to, they're going to be able to start it at 5 p.m because i want them to first get home and first have lunch etc etc et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very important and then we're going to have the deadline be we'll change the deadline you'll see when i set the deadline the free version only allows you for around two weeks or so deadline um, it doesn't open it up for an endless um, it doesn't open this up for endless access. Um, just with regards to only when you're in a school with the best technology, remember this only requires a mobile device that has connectivity and it requires very, very, very limited data. So not at all only for a school with the best technology. I've seen schools that have very limited technology use this incredibly well. Um, so it is not necessarily a technology heavy thing. I think there's a lot of value in the, especially if you're using the quizzes app, this uses minimal amounts of data. It really, really does. Um, so don't be bogged down that with that idea that my school doesn't have technology. We can't use this. Cell phones are very widespread and data is getting increasingly cheap. If we can convince, I used to tell my learners, you can spend you can basically do quizzes for an entire month and it's going to be equal to about 30 minutes to an hour's worth of you scrolling through Instagram. So it's a choice they need to make. Are they going to waste their, 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 their data or their parents' data on, on social media or are they going to do it in this way? But anyway, enough of that. So yeah, I can set a deadline. I can say, look, I'm going to give you the whole week to practice this and there you go. What I used to do with this, just to give you a sense, when my learners were writing a test, on the Thursday, for for example, I would set up one or two of these quizzes for them um, and tell them you have a week to practice these quizzes, do them as many times as you want. Now, I was an English home language teacher and um, in high school, and anyone who's taught English home language at high school will know there are, there are no multiple choice questions in any of the formal assessments. That doesn't mean that multiple choice questions cannot teach you the core fundamentals that you need to know. It doesn't mean that you can't use it. You can still use this very effectively in, in your classroom, even if you're not 
in a formal sense, testing multiple choice. It's the practice that it allows. So I'm going to assign this now. I haven't assigned it to a classroom. Um, you'll see there's other other options down here that you can play around with. There's again the amount of of, of options that it gives you. The kind of general um, flexibility within this is very very cool. Again, you you need to decide what works for you and play around with what. Um, is going to work best for you. So I'm going to say assign and now I will get my link that it'll generate for me. So there we go. So now again, same story. Here's a link that has been generated. Um, it is not a, this is not that you can't start with it now. It's only going to be open at 5 p.m. That link I need to share with my learners in whatever platform. So you're going to with, with a lot of the u effective use of quizzes, you will need to have some sort of communication platform that you have with your class where you can share links with them. It's the easiest way to do it. Alternatively, if they're used to how it works, you can have them write down this number in a homework book or whatever the case might be so that they know when they get home and they want to do the quiz, test the, to, to practice the quiz, they just go onto the app and they enter that number that they see over there. And just to show you that it basically looks the same, um, it's going to have, well, it's going to tell me I can't start yet because it's going to say this is a homework thing. This activity has not yet begun. We'll start the quiz at 5 p.m. See you when the session starts. And it effectively feels the same as the live version for the student, but it isn't the same as the live version. I hope that makes sense. Um, it's not going to be the same. One more thing that I feel is important for us to cover as well is this classes option. Um, when you are getting used to quizzes the first time around, it's cool to just kind of create a quiz and play it in your classroom and, and just get a feel and a sense of how it works. But when you want to really make it part of what, how you are going about your teaching, then this classes option becomes really critical. So with classes, here you have the option of creating a classes. You can, if you are using Google Classroom, as I said, quizzes plays really well with the Google platform. Then you can just click import classroom and it will So if I want to click on classroom, it would just give me the option to import a classroom. So um, I'm not going to do it now, but just pull in all the learner accounts, learner details, etc. from okay, now it's forcing me to do it. Um, so I would allow this connection. There is nothing that you need to be worried about that connection that's going to cause any issues there. So I'm going to say import from classroom and then you'll see here all my different classrooms that I've got. Mostly the digital skills course um, that we have. So I would be able to select any of these. I don't want to because it's going to send an email now. Um, and then it will do that. One thing that someone mentioned that is again a very, very cool function in quiz in quizzes but depends again on your context is this require parent or guardian email address because that would then mean that i can as a teacher directly send reports to the parents if they've if they've set up an email address that i'm, I'm linking to these accounts which is again very cool but sometimes a little bit tricky um, depending on the context within which you teach. If we're teaching in a context where parents do have email addresses and you know this is not going to be a problem, then yes, by all means, tick it on. If you're teaching in a context, we're not sure if your parents, if the parents really understand this, have email addresses, can use it, then I don't recommend that you necessarily use it. Um, in general, what I've often felt with a lot of these tools is first, do the easier way of just getting used to what the tool works like, especially now, if you're going to want, if you're going to try and it's a perfect time to spend the fourth term playing around with what quizzes can offer you. It's an incredibly powerful um, revision tool, consolidation tool. If, if you're preparing for the, ex if you want your kids to prepare for the exam. So perfect time to, to play around with that, explore that, see what it can do for you. And then, once you get used to the system and the whole way it works next year, you can look at getting it more formalized with your classes. If you aren't using Google Classroom, then I can simply create a new classroom. So this is going to be my new example classroom. I'm going to set up my new example classroom. I'm going to share this with you. 
so that you can join my classroom. I'm going to share the link in the chat and you'll see how quick and easy it is to actually join a classroom like that. Um, of course, they can use this code as well if they are using the app already. Then the, the code is going to be an easy way for them to join a classroom. So what will happen if you click on this link? It'll give you the option to join the classroom. So yeah, um, I've made it optional, the, the email address. Um, so I'm just not going to enter it now. Let's just say me, myself, and I. I'm going to join the classroom. And the classroom is great because the classroom allows me to effectively when I'm assigning homework, I assign it in, in that classroom. So learners would log in and they would see the activities already there. They would see the live things already there. It's a way of grouping people so that it's easier for me to get content to those people. It also allows me on this side of things. So let's just quickly refresh my classroom so that I can see who has joined it, if any of you have joined it. So you'll see there already, I've got all of you in my classroom. I've got um, the student email, no one entered a parent guardian email, that's fine. Um, and over here, I've got all of these people that have logged into my um, classroom already, which makes it easy for me to distribute content to them. I've also got the option to add students. Oh, wait, sorry, I can't add students manually. You, They have to join and they have to log in and they have to create their accounts effectively. Um, right. Are there any questions? I apologize for the, the fact that this session has been a little bit um, topsy-turvy. I did not expect to have to present today, so I wasn't 100% prepared for you. Um, but I hope that we covered and t uh, covered the, the, the important parts of quizzes um, and, and understanding it. One thing that I really want to emphasize again is the 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 way that you use quizzes is go has to be contextually specific so in other words what worked for me in my classroom might not work for you in your classroom what worked for me with the learners that i had will not necessarily work for everyone it is a case of understanding how the basic system works and then kind of scratching around and finding out what else works for you so um, one thing that I do want to want to kind of test here is the importing from Google Forms. I'm going to be completely honest. I have not done this yet. So let's see how well it works. If I import something from a Google Form, um, I am going to have to give quizzes access to my Google Drive so that it will be able to find the different ones that I have. So let's just look for a... Right, so there's a little quiz. Um, I'm trying to see what quiz would work well. Let's just use this math quiz and see how it deals with that. Um, so that's an example of what we can do. We can import um, a we can import from a Google form and see what it does for us. So three questions. This is what it's been able to import. I don't know what was else was in there. There's an image. Can you solve this? Gives me the options. So there we go. So that's a way you can take if you've got Google Forms set up with quizzes. You can pull it into the quizzes platform already. Um, I think it's going to be something that you're going to have to play around with. What what can you do? What can't you do? The lesson part, I must say, is something that I think is pretty cool that you can imp that you can explore as well. So let's say, for example, we are going to import something from Google Drive. Again, I think I'm going to have to give it permission um, because it doesn't have... Right, so I'll, I'll need to give it special permission. So if I'm going to, for example, um, let's go to the quizzes presentation. So this is the quizzes presentation. So 
So what it, again, what the lessons thing is, what's different with lessons from the normal quizzes is um, you can see here I've actually imported now. I can import the eight slides that I have. So let's import all of them. Um, I'm just going to import them as static images because I, I, if I've already created this thing on Google Slides, um, then I don't need to go and edit it anymore. So what's cool about this is here I've got my slides ready to go. Um, all of these things. So let's say if I, after the feedback loop, I'm going to say add a new slide. I want to add a multiple choice question. So now you have to understand if I'm going to present this, then what actually happens is I go through my slides and I'm going to say what is the missing part of the broken feedback loop. Um, let's again see how good it is. Input feedback, output loopback. So feedback is the part that is why it is broken. So now you'll see what's What's cool about this is I've got slide one, slide two, slide three, slide four, slide five, slide six, and then a question, and then slide eight, slide nine. So you have to understand, or you have to imagine when I'm doing this, what will happen in my classroom is I'll be presenting something and then it'll pop up as a question. So if they're logged in with their, with their devices, the minute I get to the question, then they'll see what the, the, the question, then they'll kind of, get this question that they need to answer. Um, something useful to play around with. However, when it comes to the whole quizzes platform, my suggestion is when you start with this thing, first, first, well, first time that you get into it, um, oh, sorry, let me just go there. First time you get into it, just first practice with the idea of going and not even creating, searching for a quiz and running that quiz in your classroom. So that could be the first, your first exploration. Your second exploration, I would say, is go and create a quiz and see how you can do, how you can create your own one. Then once you're comfortable with that concept, I would suggest setting up classes so that you can see how the classes thing works. And from there, sky's the limit. See what else you can do and how else you can integrate it. And um, I think I'll ask Melissa that, that when we share this, this recording with you, that will also share the link to the paperless mode that you can, not the paperless mode, sorry, the paper mode, that will share that link to you as well. Especially our schools that are that do not have a lot of technology, that mode of the paper mode is an incredibly cool thing you can do with your learners that gives you access to almost everything that's in here, especially those reports. Because the reports, that is where the secret of the whole thing lies. Your learners know your learners know what they know and what they don't know, and you know what they know and what they don't know before they actually write a test. And that is the secret to the success of this.